make me win in every way. <laughs> I love you, Carmen. I know you've been singing the whole day or teaching singing, hence I always. I love your sparkly pillow. How are you, my lovely? I'm good. I, I'm sitting on the floor. I am very good. I have a um, beautiful bird who I'm in love with, as you all know, if you watch Lost. <laughs> um, oh, I'm just happy. And you? I'm happy too. In fact, you and I are always so in sync because I'm sitting on the floor too. You'll notice my background is completely different to how it normally is. I think this is going to be my welcome Wednesday. So on that note, this is exactly it. We want to welcome everybody to our Wednesday show, which is a show that's going to always be featuring a special guest, whether it's somebody who is at the pinnacle of their career or knowledgeable in a certain field or perhaps starting out or whatever we kind of feel like we want to bring on. Um, it's going to be a third party joining us. And this week, to kick off Welcome Wednesdays, we have an absolutely remarkable guest, we Sammy. Do. He is somebody that both Carmen and I admire hugely, and it is none other than the incomparable David Dennis. Sure, he has had an absolutely formidable career in every aspect of the art sector, from film to television, from theater to radio, academia to lecturing and teaching, and of course, musical theater. He has served on the boards of so many prestigious organizations, won countless awards, and in fact, is the record holder for the most Fleur de Cap wins. He is currently head of the School of Live Performance at AFTA. He has a deep social conscience, and I really, really re resonate with that. He has contributed to the upliftment of society through the arts for decades. And most recently, he was performing in the Showtime management production of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert in Cape Town and Johannesburg, playing the coveted role of Bernadette, for which he won the Naledi and Fleur de Cap Awards for Best Actor in a Musical. It is our privilege to welcome David Dennis. Hi, David. <laughs> How Hello. are you? <laughs> Excellent. I'm just catching up with my mails, as you can see in the background. <laughs> Got to have props, Sammy. Got to have props, Dave. David, how are you? Doing? So good. Well, I got my question in first, so you you go ahead. You answer first. I am wild and woolly, as you can see during this lockdown. I can see that you are too. <laughs> it's called my lockdown locks. <laughs> I love it. How are you? I know that you are such a creative individual. So how has lockdown been treating you? Do you know what? Um, it's been an interesting time. Um, it's also been a very good time for reflection, a good time for introspection, a good time to put a lot of things in order, you know. Um, I, I've been in a very fortunate position, uh, Carmen and Sam, to be, uh, you know, to be to have a day job, you know, and rare thing that actors don't have. Um, it's a bit of a double-edged sword, but it's been a, a very good thing, I think, for me, a very sobering position to be in, especially as one gets into one's, uh, you know, early dotage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost part of the pensioners brigade now, hey? So you ought to respect, respect, respect. So um, I've, I've been very busy, to be truth, uh, to, to speak true, I've been very busy. We've been kept now very animated and very agile around uh, not only pondering the questions, but coming up with solutions to the issue of online performer training. Um, and it's not just from a perspective of screen acting, it's stage acting, it's music performance, a field in which you two young ladies are so um, so accomplished in. Um, so, and having had the privilege to see you both in Chicago, in fact, I sent you a picture of, um, of the opening night that was taken, uh, that uh, mm -hmm. just so very sweetly sent me. Um, after the event. So I've got a lovely commemoration of the evening. So okay. congratulations if I never got the chance to say to you personally on a job well done. God bless you. Thank you. That means so much coming from you. Um, really, honestly, truly, we worked so hard, as you know, Sami, to, to try and create um, 
very valuable and um, true roles because it's such a well-known show in this country and it was so famous. And, and it was so famous, you know, Samantha being in the role of Roxy and Amra being in the role of Velma, you know, that was such mm. a well-established casting. And then we both felt really responsible to, to move it forward in a way that was palatable and, and even enjoyable <laughs> for everyone else involved. <laughs> so thank you. It's such an ensemble piece. I, I, I'm supposed to be the interviewee here, but that, <laughs> I was just going to pose the question to you. Didn't you find it a very great learning experience to go back to a production, sure. maybe in the same role, in this instance, a different role? Don't you find it a, a very enriching experience, a very deepening experience? I really did. I mean, I, I kind of felt that, um, I'd felt that from, when I'd gone back to playing Roxy for the second time anyway, I'd felt the same experience of feeling that the second time round had been a much deeper experience for me. I was also much older and I felt like I was able to really link in with it and bring a whole new level of experience. But to play Velma was, was perfect at this stage in my life. And as you talk about in my early dotage, um, <laughs> Um, it, was, it, it was really possibly one of the greatest experiences and um, I'm yeah forever grateful. But I think you're right. Being able to reprise a role sort of later, you know, if there's a couple of years in between the last time you've done done the show, it does. It brings it brings with it a, a level of comfort and a level of just a different perspective completely. So yeah, you're absolutely right. And and Tom, so much. Pardon. Now I was going to say, Carmen, you're too young to be reprising any roles, surely. <laughs> Thank you. I, I will take that on. I turned 30 and I kind of felt, whoa, I don't know what that means for me um, this year. So I will definitely take that while I can. Thank you, David. Um, I think I am too young, yes, but I look forward to to reprising roles. And I, I really hope to be able to go back to Roxy. Because, you know, luckily it's one of those roles you can play almost, you know, right through your 30s, right through your 40s into your 50s. Just depends mm. on the casting. And that's the great thing about Chicago. It's just such an incredible, incredible role to uh, show, to be a part of. David, what, David which, which roles have you reprised? <laughs> goodness. Um, huh, where should we start? Um, <laughs> I've done a couple of Shakespeare's over and over. I've done the Duke of Buckingham a couple of times in Richard III. I've done Macbeth a couple of times. Um, and I've done uh, Importance of Being Earnest a couple of times. I'm not talking about within a season where you go from city to city or it's an extended run over a, a year. I'm talking about coming back to it every a couple of years later, a decade later, etc. So there have been a number of them where I've had to come back. Um, the one that I did turn down was, gosh, it, I... I it, it must have been about 15, 20 years after we originally played it, and that was Rocky Horror. I was asked to do a, a return as Riff Raff um, many years, many years after the fact. And it was uh, while the show was doing, I think it was sort of syndicated throughout all the barnyard theatres in the country. Uh, but yeah. at that stage, yeah. I thought perhaps I was a little bit long in the tooth. So, um, David, you know what? Louis Muller, I think, called me up one night out of the blue. He was then responsible, uh, you know, for syndicating the show around in all the Barnyard theatres. And I, I had to say to him, I'm so sorry. I would love to, to oblige, but uh, it just wouldn't be right for me at this time. You know what, David? I mean, you are really, you know, timeless, really. I mean, you are ageless. Um, you just continue to grow from strength to strength. For me, it's like I was, I feel hugely honored to have been able to work with you early on in my career. Um, and and I hope that I get another chance to, and I know Carmen does too, that we get a chance to actually work with you and learn from you because my experience of being introduced to you was sitting in the audience and watching Rocky Horror and, and, and watching you play Riff Raff. And I'll never forget thinking, who is this creature? Because 
you were mind blowing to me. I mean, in every possible way, you know, um, first of all, your look and, and you just embody, you just have this chameleon like quality of being able to completely embody a role. And then there was, there was that end scene where you appeared on the gangplank on the right of the, of the, of the theater. And I remember there, that was like, ah! That part. I mean, my yeah. God. I'm your Come on, God. See? And let me tell you, though, that was like, I was like, who is this man with this operatic technique, but with this rock edge, who is a phenomenal actor, phenomenal mover? And I just, and from then I was obsessed. And as you know, I followed your career, watched you in Frank. It was Frankenstein, right? That's, that's. Um, yeah, Frank and Frank, Frankenstein is a, Frank. a separated. Yeah, not the, yeah, play on the word Frankenstein, obviously. Yes. The original Frankenstein, but were two man character doing a sort of pub sketch version of the 1935 classic, which I did with Ellis Pearson. And it was a, a complete rip off, a spoof on the original. 35, playing all the characters in the film, but playing the film as these two manic, lunatic um, performers in black tails and top hat and white face, etc. But, you know, you, you're talking about Rocky particularly. Um, Sam, I always think that it's, and Carmen, sorry, darling, I don't mean to sideline. No, I'm um, yeah. this, you know, you, you raised the, the memory of that. It is always, I think, to do with having a damn good director, a director who's also very interested in what you're doing and a director who is responsive to what you're doing and who has that ability to guide and coax performance out of you. You know, we done. We were chatting the other night and we were talking about formulas, etc. Some of the, the great shows that we see today on the stage uh, we're, we're exposed to are very much formulaic. So you follow a formula, you follow the, what has been essayed before you. So you don't get the opportunity. When I was a younger actor, we had the opportunity to play with the original text, with established text, and interpret according to obviously the director's vision and all the other visions that go into the general concept. But you had that room to play. And it was very much a kind of scenario where you were encouraged to bring interpretation forward, your interpretive and analytical skills and creativity forward. Um, and, and so that people could fashion a, a, a performances out of you. Um, and it's been a great, when I was very young at university, 40, 50, 60 years ago, um, uh, one of my professors then, Mavis Taylor, for those old enough to remember, once said to me, you do realize that you will always need a good director. So that was the first challenge. Um, I realized then, uh, well, I was told then that I wouldn't make it without a good director. So that was, okay, hurdle one. Second hurdle was um, a highly accomplished actor in his day, known as the Prince of, of Theatre, the Prince of Actors in his day. And he said to me um, in fairly stentorian tones, you do realize, of course, that you will never be a leading man, but you will be a fine character man. He then went on to say, some of my best friends are character actors. They have swimming pools and tennis courts. <laughs> well, double-edged sword. I'm not quite sure how to take this one. So those are the two challenges to begin with. You'll always need a good director. You'll never be a leading man. Well, I suppose I could have answered the second question first by looking in a mirror. And that's what then decided me to focus on character, to focus on doing the things that I would be cast in to the best of my ability and then some. Uh, because I was never going to be the, uh, you know, the, the blue-eyed, uh, blonde leading man of the time, the ingenue roles for males. So I would always go into the character parts. I would always be playing older characters, etc. So it was a big challenge. And I was also the youngest when I joined the first professional company I joined. In fact, the only professional company I joined, which was then KPAB, drama. Um, and I was the youngest in the um, main drama company. So I was always playing a multitude of roles. And my very first year, you talk about the Fleur de Cap, my very first year, I'm trying to think, when did I graduate from university, UCT? It was around about 1984, I would say. And uh, my very first year out in the profession, I was nominated for a total of four productions in that year. And in all of those productions, I played more than four characters, uh, at least. So 
that was the training ground. Yeah, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, that is exactly what what I wish myself and and our generation. I'm not sure about Sami, um, but that we I know because you Sami, you belong to uh, which um, arts council? Well, well, it was I, I sort of entered the industry around the time when the arts councils were still around, and so that yes. was a, a great training ground, but not Absolutely. obviously with what you what you experienced, David. And, and we don't have and that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I certainly don't have that at all. I've never had. I can't, I can't even fathom being being a part of an arts council or having the opportunity to to kind of um, how do you say um, you know get that kind of training. So early on in our careers, you know. it's about it's about legacy. It's about passing on the baton because you're working with older actors. You learn sometimes how not to do things as well. But you then and it, this is what I find is lacking perhaps in our industry today is the lack of that legacy. Um, I was reminded of this when Brian Schimmel posted something not too long ago, saying we must remember that there were shows before Monte Cassino came along, um, and that was the nub of what he was saying. And I couldn't agree more. Um, you know, that there were stars before now, there were stars before, before now. Um, and so we had the great benefit of having companies to work in, being raised in companies, being in a repertory kind of environment where you're repeating shows, you're performing a show at night over three to four weeks or whatever the case may be, rehearsing one during the day and then churning them up. The moment you close it on Saturday, the very next Monday, you might have the theater is dark, you'd have the in production week and getting ready to open the next show in that week. So there was no luxury of sitting on laurels or anything. It was really um, doing the job of being an actor. And, yes. And being, but that's not to say that young people today cannot form companies. You know, there's so much innovation around, uh, there is so much um, ideation around, et cetera, and this should include forming companies. Collectives is what we call them now, perhaps. But there was the true company, um, Richard Esterhazen, oh, Richard Grant, Fiona Ramsey, Sean Taylor, Fred Abramson, all of these people who formed a company of their own group, quite, quite a reputation for the innovative work that they did um, they were entirely uh, responsible and answerable to themselves. Um, and while we're challenged in this COVID world, we should be challenged to look for new realms of creating work, mm -hmm. new frontiers, and new ways of realizing um, creative opportunities for young people and forming companies. Uh, as I said before we started chatting, very brave, very courageous of you two to get together and put on such a catchy little thing called Soul Sisters, dealing with the issues that you are dealing with in terms of soul searching, exploring it on so many different levels and platforms, how it relates to life and how it relates to art and that thing of um, art imitating life and vice versa, etc. Yeah, you know, this is the importance of who we are as creative people and artists. So I wish you all extremely well with this venture. Thank you, David. And, and you know, I have to say that there's such, you know, such dedication and discipline in what you're speaking about in terms of your training and, and also in terms of creating stuff, like you're saying, creating work. Um, it keeps your muscles flexed in all areas. And so you just throw yourself at something and you're learning all the time. And I think that's hugely valuable. And, and from my perspective, having been part of the Arts Councils, we had a similar kind of, of experience where we would be rehearsing a show in the day and performing another one at night. And they were long tours, long tours for then, of about eight months of touring around the country. And you'd finish and you'd start rehearsing the next show. And, you know, and, and even children's theatre, being involved in all sorts of aspects as well. And I do think that is so important. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. There is, is something about um, this new generation where it sort of feels like things need to be handed to you. Or maybe, you know, there is the, the idea of overnight um, fame <laughs> um, based on all these reality shows. And, and, and we know, like, it's important to create a lasting career, which is what you have done. And the other night, speaking to you, um, having the conversation and reminding you of all the things that you have done. Um, and then obviously for me as well to play Janet when you played Frank and watching your process. So you went from Roof to playing Frank and Furter, watching you. So I'd seen you in the audience and like Carmen was saying, you know, these people that come before us, 
there is a whole slew of them as well that, that they came before me but you were really somebody that to watch you work as well was somebody that i watched intensely in the rehearsal process um and i think it is important you're absolutely right that generational kind of feed you know into the next generation and to people need to open and expand and and dig deeper and understand like you say there were always those that came before there will be those that come after us and i want to ask you what do you think your life purpose has been gosh uh, it's a question i think i probably asked myself not in great depth but it's sort of surfaced from time to time you know, friends like Mark Banks, many other people have said to me, why didn't you go overseas when you were 21, 22? You know, I mean, people have said to me countless times, gosh, you would have wiped up, you'd have cleaned up. Colin Law was remembering the other night um, and you were in that conversation um, with our experience with Chris Malcolm. I mean, Chris Malcolm really drew things out. You talk about that, with that ah, all of that stuff, that rock edge to the classical training. You know, I probably wouldn't have discovered that if it wasn't for him pulling it out. But he said something about oh, this chap would have made it in the in the West End, etc. You know, with all of this. But the challenge, I think, was growing up in the South Africa then that it yeah. was, yeah. Um, with its uh, limited exposure for the majority of people in this country to arts and the practice of the arts, the exposure to the arts in that form as we understand it the western style theater etc so uh, and we're obviously very much influenced by a colonial heritage it took me some time um but i eventually realized that my value was my true value seemed to be to remain here yes as a young artist as a young actor i should say because i've never really called myself an artist um i leave that to the great and the good but as a young mm -hmm. actor I, I i accepted the fact that I would have to remain here. Yeah, I accepted the fact that I probably would not be suitable for every role, that I had a particular look that would only fit a particular type and all of that sort of thing. Um, and as time moved on, I perfected or tried to perfect my technique and skills, etc., by learning all of these other things, including teaching, including you know, many other aspects that you've already mentioned in your intro. Mm -hmm. And then came along a time where the, the, the provincial arts councils, that we've just been talking about collapsed um, quite correctly, I might add, because we had to address the issue of uh, uh, there's a huge redress when it comes to the uh, um, uh, equalizing the playing field in this country. So we moved away. I tended to move away then from the from theatre, from particularly musical theatre, where I made a, a bit of a splash, and uh, television came in. How did that come in? Because of the language issue because I spoke Kosa. Bobby Heaney said to me, you speak an African language, don't you? There's this role coming up in a show called Soul City. Well, to say that the world changed for me would be an understatement in terms of one's audience, one's exposure to a very broad base in this country that had been previously marginalized and excluded. Suddenly, there was all of that to deal with. Suddenly, my world changed and became far more dedicated and focused on what was the present challenge at the time. And that was addressing those issues that I felt so strongly about through what were the tools I had? These simple tools I had as an actor. My voice, the brain that I had, the skills that I had, the language. I keep saying this to young students that I'm working with, to young people, address the language issue in this country. Get upskilled with the languages of this country. It will open so much more. Look at what we are fraught, what is the, 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 the subject matter that is fraught on social media today. If we learn yeah. to talk to each other, if we learn through mm -hmm. learning and understanding people's languages, and all of a whole other world of stuff opens up. I wasn't, I don't regard people say, oh, you are lucky. Luck hadn't much to do with it, actually. Circumstance, yes. Um, opportunity, yes. My family background, my history, yes. I don't see luck in there. I used what I had mm -hmm. as my skills, as what we all possess. We all, there. I have, I'm not possessed of anything more extraordinary than anybody else. You sound <laughs> like Anthony Hopkins right now. I mean, that's yes, the kind I was of thing. Say. 
That's what he use says. Use what you have. Yeah, use what you have. And that was what I had. And it was an opportunity. You know that whole thing of being in the right place at the right time? So long story short, darling, if I had gone to the UK, I might have focused on playing a handful of Shakespearean roles. Perhaps I would have got to play a few more Arabs than I do now. Because um, I'm always playing the bearded, nasty types. Um, uh, so uh, 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 I could have done that. You, we all know that a lot of actors in the UK have very limited CVs. South African actors are blessed with great CVs because they do so many different things. Um, and I might have missed the opportunity to make a difference in my country uh, amongst my people. And I mean, broadly speaking, I'm not talking to one community. I'm talking to my people, this country, that I have tried in one, in my own small way to serve through the arts. Um, now I'm more like I'm serving in other areas academic administration, heading on the school, uh, serving on the arts and culture board, um, the, the HIV AIDS program that I was a patron of and still have a connection to. All of those things became very important to me because I valued this country, I valued the artists of this country, and I wanted what I did not to be as good as, but better than that which we were being compared to. Why should I leave it at the West End or the Great White Way, Broadway? Why can I not create that in my own country? And it, I've lived so long to see the cultural boycott come to an end and those international film companies come here and get to work with the international names, a lot of which I could brag about on this platform, but I won't. Um, and all through one's own recognizances, I fairly auditioned, um, have developed and grown relationships that I, you know, having worked with the BBC on a number of different programs, BBC Studios, BBC One, the producers will say, oh, no, we know that guy. He's worked for the BBC before. So please just call him to the, let him come to the callback. We don't need him to audition. Uh, David Drury and, and, you know, so many of these people that we have, we see names coming up. And I have such fun now watching Holby City and various other things because one didn't get to see much telly before now. Yeah. To see all these yeah. actors, and I think, oh, I recognize they were in that show, uh, that's the etc. So, I've had a lovely experience of having all of these things come to our country, had the experience of working on the international things without leaving. Do you know what I have to also to say is that um, we're talking like leaving the country, and I think it, 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 even, it even extends further to I mean, I, my sister works with Columbia Leadership. You know Tracy, David, and um, I've done some work with them as well. And and when she's worked with some of these incredible young leaders, incredible leaders, with incredible knowledge and academic prowess, and they've gone and the, the one particular guy that I'm talking about, Sonolo Lukopo, if you're listening, he um, <laughs> he studied um, biochemistry at Wits, and then ended up going and teaching in a, in a school in Lanseria. And the principal was saying to him, you know, you could go and teach anywhere. In fact, you could go and earn more money if you go into, you know, teach at private schools. And his feeling was, but then what happens to my community? Yeah. Yes. You see. And so it even starts there. It starts there. And then, I mean, I think that's hugely, um, it, it's inspiring to think that a youngster would think that way. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I take my hat off to young people like that. I think we're in a very different world now. I think we have a lot more, you were saying about young people, you know, perhaps expecting things to be handed to them. I think that things might have been simpler in my generation. The challenges that, you know, the choices might have been simpler, more straightforward than they are for younger generations. And I speak with respect to the, the young people who are now at exit level in the course that I've been heading for the last six years. And I worry. But I also think they're, they're in a brave new world, in a brave new frontier. They are privileged to be at the, at the, at the beginning of something. And Absolutely. that's what my focus has been, is to help them understand that. You don't know how privileged, I mean, you are to be at the threshold of something. 
and especially I'm in this country. I'm in a state of flux somewhere, hanging between one great event and another. Yes, we had the dissolution of the apartheid regime uh, and the you know the discriminatory discriminatory setup that was there before the order that we were subjected to. We didn't think it would end, and then democracy came, a new dispensation. So yes, there was this big change, but then ultimately, when we look into it deeper, how much actually has changed? So in a different kind of way, our young people entering this world on the threshold of their futures um, have the opportunity to grapple with this. I know it's fearful. I know it's so anxiety making and stressful for everybody. Where's the next buck going to come from? All I can say is, is that use the opportunity, grab the chance now to deal with it, embrace this new future, this threshold that we're on, and you will be leading the way in a very, very short space of time. We mustn't be defeated by this, not at all. And and I and I want to add that, especially being South African, we we really do have a unique um, opportunity to, in this country, for our generation, the, you know, let's say graduates now, to lead what has already been done in other countries, um, because it's we are still such a new democracy. We are a new industry, actually, in terms of musical theatre. Um, and there's so much opportunity. I think that I think it's really important for the millennials, and I'm I'm just on the cusp of millennials, so I admit I'm one. Um, to have that mindset that you had, and, and and your generation and the elder generations, not to forget to to learn, to want to learn, to want to innovate, think out of the box. Um, look for opportunities, and millennials are very good at that. But they, they, they also want to. They don't want to work too hard, or, or take too much risk, or um, think too much outside of the box. And I think that it's important to to remind all of y'all out there, you're watching and you're still studying. It's important to listen to what David said. It's scary, but take risks. Know what you're yeah. good at, and do absolutely. What you can and, and deal with it in small packages. You know, take it as that old um, African adage is about um, eating an elephant in small yes. bits. So really, where are we all rushing to? Um, you know, let's just take this at a time. And that was a lot of what I did too. Perhaps I was too careful in the beginning. Maybe I, you know, I could have uh, had more courage and gone overseas, you know, 40 years ago. But I would have missed out on everything else that happened as a result of things changing in my life. Um, it's. I, I was very careful about taking the steps at a time when other chaps were in university with me. They were rushing off to the radio studios to go and do um, radio plays and doing all sorts of things and getting roles in television and what. And I thought, where's everybody rushing off to? Can't we just do the training first, get that secure? And it's my attitude now to my students because a lot of people come to university asking, can you hook us up with a you know a 16 year old? We want someone young looking and we want people from the university. I'm thinking, no, don't use people who are in training, not because I want to deny them opportunity. I want to afford those who have just exited and have just entered the world of work an opportunity to get work. All of the entry level, all of the young people who are entering the industry should be given that opportunity, not those who are still in training. So don't come and poach my students. Let them train. Let them get what they need to get. Yes, let them suffer a little bit as well, because you, art is nothing without some pain, without some suffering. Otherwise, what is it? We sit around in our lounges chatting over a cup of tea, exchanging the latest gossip. No, we want to tell meaningful stories. We want to tell narratives that are relevant, that are accessible, that are going to reach in to the people we want to engage with. Otherwise, why would audiences bother with us? That's our why, duty. Why take my bum for two hours and park it on a seat for 250 bucks and tell me nothing? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I, I'm certainly glad you didn't leave because, I mean, I've also adoringly watched you on stage. Hope, hopefully we'll work together, but learned so much just from watching. And, you know, as, as a younger performer, asking the right questions in your mind as you watch older performers or as you learn is also very important. Um, don't just observe, but observe intelligently and with with um curiosity you know um 
And Never stop asking awesome. questions. Never stop asking questions. Uh, Chris Weir, I keep talking about people, but these okay, are all people. Who are <laughs> Chris Weir used to say that. Uh, so we're we're running out of time, and I could. I said we're I, running I, I, out I, of time, and I could sit and talk to you for years. But there well, are two we'll, things we'll, that I want to ask you. Over, over, over. Yes, a, but a there's something. Or something. Yes. But I Chris know, Weir, but I think I really like, want. David, I stop drinking. Are you going to go first or shall I? David, I have to, I have to ask the acting questions, and I know Carmen probably does as well. I have two, and I'm going to jump in quickly so that Carmen also has a chance. First of all, I want to ask you, um, your background. When did you, as a kid, when did you realize, at what, at what age did you realize that this is what you wanted to do or this, that you had a natural talent for or an interest in, and why? What were you exposed to? That was my question. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I'll tell you. Um, I, you know, I, I grew up I, still, you know, in a practicing Roman Catholic family, and um, obviously we were exposed to religious music and the high days and the holy days, etc. Uh, my mother is a very fine is a Puccini soprano, actually, and at eighty-six still has a very fine voice. I must tell you, um, and. So I was exposed to that in terms of music and the appreciation of music and in that context. Um, we didn't, not as children, my, you know, in my, fa my family, for example, my mother and her sisters, of which there are three all told, um, were, had to play piano, had to play violin and entertain the guests, you know, when they came to visit our home. So this is going back, uh, you know, into the fifties, uh, forties, uh, thirties. So you know that was the, the the kind nature of things in those times. I didn't until I got to boarding school and um, when there was a school play. Um, I didn't, and I thought, oh, you know what? I think I, fa I fancy myself as a singer, so I'll go to the auditions. This is after seeing things going and people performing. Richard Grant was at my at, at school with me. He was ahead of me. So there was all this extraordinary stuff going, and I thought, ah, no, nah, it's not for me really. And then I went to go and sing. That, as I said, I fancied myself as a singer. And then the uh, director, who would also happen to have written the piece, said, "Well, why don't you audition for an acting role?" Which I did. And next thing I knew, I was landed with the lead, and I was stuck in rehearsals every night. So that was a pain. And, um, and then my school work suffered over the next three years because then I couldn't stop. If I get bitten, and I was doing everything for inter-house plays, uh, one-act play festivals, school play, you know, the whole thing. And then they introduced musicals with Joseph, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it, so it was very late. It, I was already what 17, 16. I had no. I'd, the only thing I thought I might do was become a concert pianist or something because I played piano, and that's what I. Grew Anthony up Hopkins. Uh, <laughs> and, but then that put pay to that, and um, uh, Robin Malan, who you may remember, um, joined water at the school I was at the year I was exiting in my A-levels. And he was the one who said, you should go. Go to UCT. And uh, there's also Rita Mars in Cape Town. Go and audition and try out. And that's really when I got into the idea of being an actor, was when I was a school leaver and going into first year university. Wow. Incredible. But storytelling as a kid. Storytelling yeah. with my niece, with nephews, with my siblings, younger siblings, keeping them entertained. My grand used to always say, if the children all go quiet, you'll know exactly where they are. They're probably somewhere in a room listening to a story, and it'll be David with them. <laughs> That's, but you see, I believe that we are born with, with um, talents. I do, I do believe so. And whether we choose to pursue them, it's, it's up to us. But I want to know, um, what I want to know from you is, do you enjoy working at night? <laughs> do you enjoy working in the theater, you know, night after night? Or are you somebody who finds that challenging? I think in winter, if you ask me that question in summer, in winter, I'd have two different answers. I'd also, if you asked me the question if I was 25, and now that I'm 60, uh, and I'm publicly admitting to it, um, I would answer differently. Right. I've got, I got so used to the, the idea of going to do a performance and having it recorded, et cetera, never having to go back to it again when mm -hmm. you're filming something. And that really spoiled me. Um, but 
it does take a fair amount of stamina doing the nightly thing, the nine day, you know, a nine show day, three, you guys have done uh, pantos, three shows a day, sometimes four shows a day. And when you get through the second show, you think, well, I've only got two left to do. Uh, so yeah. I think there have been grueling moments that really test your, your resolve in that regard, that, that, that sausage machine churning it out. I always fancied rather the operatic way of doing things where, you know, you perform once every four days. But, <laughs> but that machine will not remain oiled. Mm -hmm. that, 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 that performance, which obviously you should not let go out of hand, you're not there to be improving on it nightly, but to set it and get it to a pattern that is well oiled, well honed, well crafted, without messing with the concept or the vision, etc. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm very um, uh, particular in that way, I suppose, uh, in terms of don't muck with what, you know, if we wanted you to direct the show, we would have employed you as the director. You're the actor, do the job of the actor. Oh my um, God. Thank so, you, are so <laughs> fabulous. And David, you know what, I also wanted to just ask you, um, first of all, I mean, this is going to be a difficult question to answer, but your process, I mean, I've always been fascinated by the way you brick by brick, step by step, creates a character and the rehearsal process for you. And it's like you, um, you go into rehearsal and you take your time. You take your time to discover, whereas a lot of people, myself included, have felt the pressure to arrive on the first day of rehearsal and to really be at some sort of performance level. And I've watched you and I thought that is the way it should be. You know, your process. And it's about also notation. I write down every performance. Um, we were doing, uh, 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 one of my lecturers was studying with the music students, um, a return, to the, uh, a return to the Forbidden Planet. And I, they asked for my script. And I hauled it out somewhere and I handed it over and I said, but well, please, this is fairly precious, don't, don't let go of it. Because those are, those are biblical documents. Those are records that are, and I was shocked at the detail that I could, that was written there. Every detail of what that band, how the band was arranged, how the set was arranged, and this applies to any show that I'm doing. I have a pictorial uh, setup, uh, you know, the pictures on the page for every scene what the arrangement of the props and the furniture and the other actors are. And I draw little diagrams of what my moves are instantly so I can record. So if anybody comes to me and says, oh, you're in the wrong position there, etc., I go, here's the record. <laughs> I always that work with the pencil. I always work with my script in hand. I make notes as they are given for moves, even if they change, it's fine. Yes, some directors might find that laborious and, and, and arduous to deal with, but I won't, I won't disrupt the process. You continue at your pace and let me just make notes. Because I go and study those notes, put it back together again, and play with the learning of the words. Don't learn the words before you know what it is that you're actually saying, or that yes, you wish yes. to be saying, or that you should be saying. Make notes, do the stresses, play with the stressing all through the line. And don't only learn the line for the line's sake, line the, learn the line in the context of all the other lines. Not just in the scene, in the act, in the play. You say something now at the beginning, scene one, act one. What is its impact? What is its relevance to something else you might revisit thematically somewhere else in the play? And you've got to have that picture. You've got yeah. to bring vision and bring a director's vision to life. And the only way to, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's a number, by, you know, a point, number, what is it, point by point, numbers by numbers game. But that's how arduous it is. And you read that script and you will see exactly what that performance was. Yeah. Every yeah. choice that I made is recorded there. Every stress, and particularly when it comes to Shakespeare and playing with the rhythm, playing with the alliteration, playing with the imagery, the metaphor, all of these things bring the words to life. Those, you have to get it off the page, from the page <laughs> to the stage. You know, too many performances sit in the book and stay there. Yeah. You know, at some point it has to fly. You have to liberate the breath in order to liberate the voice, in order to liberate the performance. You have to reach. 
But the point is, and that's even if you're in a 2000 seater or in a 20 seater, I've learned so much in theater that has helped me in film and in television or TV studios or multicam setups. I've learned so much in that scenario that has impacted on how I deal with intimacy in the theater, in dealing with contact in the theater. We have to be able to bring these things, uh, you know, to cross over one into the other and inform each other in terms of process, in terms of reach, in terms of contact. Um, and I don't see the separation. I mean, people will say, ah, oh, screen acting is something completely different to stage acting. I think that's all bollocks. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, honest. <laughs> does that answer uh, your question? Yes, it does. In fact, um, David, we have to wrap it up. But, um, and Carmen, is there anything else you want to ask before we do? I have really been just once again inspired by, ch by chatting to you. And thank you for sharing such a wealth of knowledge with us. And for those who are going to watch after this and who are watching now, it's so important. These are things that you can't learn um, at school or without really experiencing them yourselves. And, and if we can apply what, what your generation and those that have come before us um, have taught us, if we can apply that, it's gonna save us a lot of heartache. And um, these are pearls of wisdom out there, guys. And it's mm. just thank you, thank you for being here today. Yeah, and the thing is never be ashamed, never to be shy to try out. Don't only have one way of doing things. And that's my story, that Chris Weir story. He used to complain that you can't give David Dennis one thing to do. He's going to come up with five versions of that. <laughs> <laughs> David, I want to say to you that um, I hope that you direct me. Carmen, I'm sure you feel the same. I yes, would love please. to be directed by you. <laughs> I want to remind everyone to please donate to Waiting in the Wings, which supports artists who are currently in need. And finally, to wrap it up, I would like you, David, one last thing and keep it short. We know you can go on, but I love you going on. So we'll have to have you on again. But I want you to just say, you know, we've been dealing with how art imitates life, imitates art. What is your experience of that? Have you found that within your own life, that you've, you've come to certain roles at a particular time in your life? You know I what I mean? I, yeah, I, I think one, uh, without getting giddy about it and, and, and big headed about it, I think humility is the biggest lesson. And humility in the way that the audience is, particularly I think with my experience with Soul City, um, to respect people, to re the respect that people showed. For the, remember I was in that instance playing a character that was HIV positive. Um, and it was extraordinary the way people would approach me um, uh, for assistance on one level or another. Now, we are also at a time where stories are being told that are reaching into people's homes that never reached before. Um, uh, so that, 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 that relationship, audience and performer relationship taught me a lot of humility. Uh, yes, failure has taught me a lot of humility. A lot of other things have taught me, you know, but uh, one, one tries to move beyond bad crits and so on. And, and other forms of criticism um, and learn from those things. Take from it what you can. But humility, we are in service to something. Amen. Brilliant note to end on. David, you have been phenomenal and I hope that we can catch up very, very soon and have a big hug. And thank you again for joining us on our very first Welcome Wednesday. Comes, anything else you want to say before we say goodbye to this legend of a man? I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for, for gracing us today with your with your knowledge and your humility and just just for being so open to talking about whatever we wanted to ask. And that is really a gift. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you for inviting me. Pleasure. Everybody, David Dennis. Mwah. Can I have my drink now? Yes. yes. <laughs> Cheers, everyone. Good health. Bye. <laughs>